we're very lucky to have here today uh, John Feiner, the Principal Deputy National S Security Advisor and uh, good friend and former colleague and comrade in arms of mine during the Obama administration. We're especially lucky to have John here today because I think the president is traveling domestically, the national security advisor is out of town, the secretary of state is in Africa, so uh, John is pretty much running the country. So we, we, value, we value, at least the foreign policy side, we value this, uh, this half hour that you've loaned to us. Um, I will say, honestly, and I know what I'm talking about, John is truly an, a really astute foreign policy practitioner. Um, the Deputy National Security Advisor job, I also know from my t time working in the NSC, is probably the busiest, highest pressure job uh, in, in Washington, if not on planet Earth. So I'm not going to burn up any of his short time with us by uh, repeating the bio information that is in the program. Uh, I'm simply going to cede the podium to him, and then we'll have a chance to chat a little bit. So John, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Danny, uh, and thanks to the Asia Society. Uh, I should say uh, that Danny is both a, a great colleague and a good friend, uh, as well as a fount of wisdom on the topics uh, I know that you're all discussing during the course of this conference, but, but uh, in all the work that we do every day, and I've appreciated his willingness to continue consulting with us, uh, even though he has left government behind for greener pastures. Um, President Biden said the history of the 21st century will be written in Asia, and I think uh, 2023, the year uh, that we've just uh, left behind, saw us uh, take significant and historic steps forward that will be written about uh, when the history of, of Asia in the 21st century is, uh, is drafted. I'm going to go through, I think, three areas uh, in which we believe we've made significant steps forward while uh, acknowledging that there remain uh, enormous challenges in this consequential region. The first is with our foundational uh, alliances on, on which all of our foreign policy in this administration is based. President Biden begins and ends his, his view of the world uh, with America's alliances uh, and our Asian uh, and Indo-Pacific alliances very much uh, on that list. Starting uh, with an historic ROK uh, Japan trilateral meeting uh, at Camp David that really was uh, both an important event in its own right and the fruits of, of many years of, of labor uh, to reach that point. Uh, and that represented uh, and moved forward significant advances in strengthening our deterrence and our extended deterrence at a time when that is uh, sorely needed. I would also include among these trilateral arrangements uh, the US-Japan-Philippines trilateral uh, format that we are working to develop uh, through a call that our national security advisors uh, did in December focused on cybersecurity, maritime security, and economic security, and that's a format we intend to take forward to 2024. We also saw in 2023 the launch of AUKUS uh, after, again, uh, many years of work, uh, and then toward the end of the year, significant steps forward in legislation to move, uh, in particular, Pillar 1, our submarine pillar, uh, to the next level. Uh, other alliance work uh, that we believe was truly historic on the Philippines, we expanded our enhanced uh, defense cooperation agreement. We had three state dinners with Indo-Pacific countries out of the four this administration has held, and I think uh, some of you may have seen that we just announced today uh, there will be a fourth Indo-Pacific state dinner in, in April uh, when Prime Minister Kishida and Japan uh, will come to town. So we believe our alliances are uh, in an historically strong state and, and frankly, uh, not a moment too soon given uh, the state of the security environment in the world. Second, we believe that we have embarked on very strong trajectories on our most consequential strategic relationships uh, in the Indo-Pacific, starting with India, uh, where we made major steps forward in our technology and defense cooperation uh, to really make good on what has been a bipartisan focus of the United States uh, for decades. Uh, while also managing our differences uh, in a mature way. With the PRC, our primary uh, economic and, and geopolitical competitor, uh, but also a country with whom we must coexist, 
Uh, we began the year in what many, uh, probably many in this room, were calling an historic nadir in the relationship. Uh, but after months of, of careful diplomacy at high levels, uh, culminating uh, obviously with the Woodside Summit between President Biden and President Xi, where we reached important outcomes on AI, on military-to-military -military dialogue, and on fentanyl, uh, uh, an issue uh, that probably is as consequential uh, to American life as, as almost any, uh, we have established a higher degree of stability in this relationship without, we believe, compromising the competitive agenda that is at the core of it, uh, including taking significant competitive steps and competitive actions on export controls at the intersection of national security and technology. Third area, uh, we believe we've also made historic steps with swing voters, swing states in the region, uh, to enhance and upgrade our ties, starting with Vietnam, uh, where the president made an historic trip in September uh, to upgrade our relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership, but also including Indonesia, the ASEAN countries, where we also upgraded our relationship uh, to CSPs, and also including ongoing and deep engagement, unprecedented uh, engagement really at the head of state level with the Pacific Island nations, which the president has personally uh, invested in, uh, including a, a new defense cooperation agreement with PNG. Now, uh, as everyone here knows, all of this came in the context of two simultaneously major global crises, neither of them in the Indo-Pacific, uh, which we have been working assiduously to manage as we stand up for Ukraine uh, against Russia's onslaught and support Israel uh, in the wake of the horrific October 7th attacks uh, and the broader security crisis in the Middle East that that has spawned. And I think one important note, uh, even if it's not the focus of, of your uh, uh, conference or of my remarks, is that a hallmark of this administration has been our focus on and our ability to invest our transatlantic and Pacific allies uh, in each other's security challenges, and we have benefited uh, from major contributions uh, from our Indo-Pacific partners uh, in each of the crises uh, that we are working to manage day in, day out. All of that said, uh, and as strong a position as we believe we are in uh, headed into 2024, we acknowledge, uh, and it's at the forefront of our agenda, that there are significant challenges that remain for us to manage uh, in this region. I'll just go through three or four of them. First, uh, may sound bureaucratic, but we think it's critically important, actually implementing the bold steps uh, that we've announced over the first three years of our time in office, including uh, steps announced through AUKUS, uh, through the Quad, through IPEF, and, and obviously at the recent Woodside uh, Summit, making those real uh, in the world. Second, uh, managing continued turbulence across the Taiwan Strait, including in the context of a political transition uh, in Taipei. Third, standing up against uh, PRC efforts to alter the status quo uh, by coercion in both South and East China Seas, including our recent focus on the second Thomas Shoal. And of course, the perpetual challenge uh, posed by the DPRK, where uh, we have to acknowledge, despite uh, our historic steps forward to enhance uh, deterrence and many attempts, uh, genuine uh, attempts at engagement, uh, they remain on a deeply disturbing and destabilizing trajectory. So that's how we see the landscape. That is the, both the, the record and the work plan uh, for 2024. Uh, we believe it is a far more advantageous environment in the Indo-Pacific for the United States and our partners uh, than the one that we inherited three years ago. Uh, we acknowledge that significant challenges remain uh, and we will continue to be laser focused on, on implementing the President's agenda. Thank you. I have a, oh, here we go. Um, make sure, thanks a lot. Make sure mine's working too. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, we got about 20 minutes. I have about 222 good. questions that will work. Five second answers should, should <laughs> suffice. But, so let me start. You touched on briefly uh, the Middle East. You touched briefly on uh, Russia, Ukraine, and also, for that matter, the transatlantic partnership. You, in addition to working the Asia account, which is what we're focused on, sort of cover planet Earth. What does it look like for you as a policymaker? How do these things intersect? How do they fit together? We also do space, by the way. Um, but uh, no, it's 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 a, a good and important uh, question. And and you know, as a as basically a generalist, I, I 
had a focus on the Middle East earlier in my career, uh, the intersection of regional challenges, functional challenges, has, has always been at the core of my work and obviously always is at the core of our work uh, as a country uh, that is big, that is broad, uh, and that has global interests. You can't really afford uh, to lose focus on any particular uh, uh, area of the world at, at any given time. And in the current moment, you know, I think the, the, the two overriding crises that we are facing that I, that I was just describing, uh, the, the conflict in the Middle East uh, and the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, touch every region of the world. You know, on, on Russia-Ukraine, uh, the, the conflict sparked or exacerbated, is probably the better way to put it, a, a global food sec uh, security crisis that was already underway. Uh, that implicated uh, countries in, in Africa, in Latin America, that frankly may not have had a, a sort of geopolitical view of the war, but they knew they didn't like it because the imp implications uh, and the impact on their own uh, population. So that required uh, both a diplomacy to manage how that uh, shaped their own uh, views of the conflict, uh, but also to try to address uh, the knock-on effects uh, of the war, even as we were supporting Ukraine's effort uh, to fight it. That's just one example of the way in which that conflict has reverberated. Uh, in, in Gaza, uh, we are seeing uh, Iran-backed groups uh, take advantage in an opportunistic way uh, of the conflict by taking actions that are having a global impact. The, the foremost example of this is probably uh, the Houthis uh, in Yemen who have decided uh, in response, uh, they say, to the conflict in Gaza to essentially wage war on the global economy by going after uh, commercial ships, dozens of commercial ships uh, transiting the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mendeb uh, and the Arabian Sea, uh, ships that, you know, are flagged by one country, owned by another, uh, and carry cargo that is destined uh, for a third country, maybe started their journey in a fourth country. So this touches, again, dozens of countries uh, around the world, has significant economic impact. Uh, you know, when these ships have to uh, go around uh, the Cape of Good Hope instead of going through uh, the Red Sea, that adds 10 days to their journey. In an industry like shipping, where everything is just in time, uh, down to the minute, the economic uh, implications of this can be significant. So we are working with countries around the world to manage that crisis diplomatically, uh, through sanctions, uh, through defensive uh, a coalition that we have built uh, to, to protect these ships, and as you've seen uh, us at least two times now, uh, with direct military action to try to suppress and degrade that threat. All right, well that was more than five seconds. Sorry. Um, but what about in the other direction? What about uh, Asia, Asian partners uh, engaging or influencing the events in the Middle East or in Russia, Ukraine? Yeah, I think one of the things we are most proud of, honestly, in the context of this response is that our Indo-Pacific partners have stepped up to be supportive, uh, sometimes in ways that are open and overt, uh, sometimes in ways that are quiet uh, and behind the scenes, but in all cases, uh, in ways that are meaningful and contribute uh, to both our interests and to what we believe is the right resolution of these uh, conflicts. We're seeing that very much in the context uh, of Ukraine, where countries have stepped up to provide direct assistance uh, to Ukraine, including you know, in cases that you would not expect. And you're seeing that in the context as well of uh, the conflict I just described, where if you look at the joint statements that have been issued in support of US military action, which is not always the most popular uh, thing that we do in our foreign policy, you are seeing countries in all regions of the world, including the Indo-Pacific, say that they are for that uh, and, and standing uh, behind our efforts to try to get our arms around that threat. Well, you began your remarks by talking about the uh, Biden administration's heavy investment in alliances and partners, and I wanna come back to that, I think that's, really important, and in the context of the uh, Middle East, you mentioned other countries in the Indo-Pacific stepping up. Um, but when it comes to China, uh, you, and you've conceded the point that the US and China are gonna have to coexist, um, then there was a time when we cooperated effectively with China on, say, the Iran nuclear program. Um, Prince Turkey is here, Ambassador Tsui is here. Um, there's been a kind of a very monumental shift in the uh, Iran-Saudi uh, agreement that was uh, brokered, at least in the final stages, by China. How much space is there for China and the United States to address either the current Middle East crisis or, for that matter, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, where, as you point out, 
we're all and the rest of the world is paying a heavy price for um, for those uh, crises. So I'm not going to. Uh uh, sort of rehash, particularly for this group, which is steeped in it, uh, the sort of theological uh, evolution of U.S.-China policy over a period of years and the conventional wisdom on that. What I will say is this administration has been quite clear about a few things. One, we believe fundamentally that there is competition at the core of this relationship. But as you indicated, uh, where there are areas in which it is in our interest to do it, and there are a number of them, uh, you mentioned climate, uh, several others emerged uh, from the Woodside Summit, uh, including fentanyl, uh, including potentially uh, AI, and we'll embark on those conversations and see where they go, uh, we are open uh, to, to having these discussions. And even in areas in which there is fundamental disagreement, uh, like the Russia-Ukraine conflict, on certain elements uh, of that conflict, and I'm thinking in particular uh, on the nuclear saber rattling that Russia and President Putin were doing uh, at an earlier stage, uh, we talked about that topic, uh, with the PRC. Uh, we believe fundamentally uh, that they had no interest in Russia using nuclear weapons uh, in Ukraine. And so there are areas, elements uh, in which uh, there can be constructive diplomatic conversations, even in a broader context of, of disagreement. On, uh, on the Gaza war, uh, again, uh, I'll leave it to uh, PRC leaders to articulate their position on the overall conflict. We think it is fundamentally not in China's interest for global sea lanes to be shut down, particularly sea lanes that carry a significant amount of trade to uh, the PRC itself. And so we have uh, engaged the PRC uh, to use their influence uh, to try to uh, end the threat uh, that, is, that, that global shipping is, is facing. So uh, we are not averse to the type of uh, discussions that you're uh, alluding to. We believe the relationship at its core is fundamentally competitive, and we're going to continue to take uh, competitive steps, as we have in the context of some of the export controls. Uh, that were announced uh, during the course of the fall and that we will continue uh, to, to roll out this year. Uh, but we don't see those as mutually exclusive, particularly in a context in which we have enough high-level uh, diplomatic engagement to, to maintain guardrails around the relationship. So it, not to belabor the point, but um, you're seeing, at least in theory, there's some prospect given common interests in maintaining the sea, openness of the sea lanes and restraining, uh, or even in defending the principle of territorial integrity in Ukraine. Some prospect for the US and China finding enough commonality in our objectives to, to, to coordinate, if not cooperate? I mean, I think that probably over, overstates the case uh, a bit. And, and frankly, though, I, I think that would be a very good question to pose and to put uh, to, to PRC officials. Uh, if you do stand for territorial integrity, how do you reconcile that with uh, what has been, in other contexts, much more full-throated support uh, for both President Putin and Russia and for the project uh, that they have embarked on, very damaging project in, in Ukraine? If you stand for the free flow of, of commerce, global commerce, and, and, you, and you should, given your interest in it and ours, uh, what are you doing to actually uh, try to bring about an end uh, to the threat in a, in a, in a you know, very illegitimate way that is being posed to that commerce? Um, they're better positioned to answer that question than I am, but, um, but I think it's a very legitimate set of questions to ask. So if the Woodside Summit uh, helped to stabilize uh, or at least retard the downward spiral, the intensification of US-China strategic rivalry, competi not, not competition, but rivalry. Um, and we've got uh, the rest of 2024 uh, ahead of us. You mentioned, for example, the AI uh, dialogue. I know that there is an economic and a financial working group. There's a bit of a strategic dialogue. Uh, I know that uh, the White House, the National Security Council conducts with uh, the Chinese side. What are the prospects for 2024 in terms of not predicting the future, but what is it that the administration thinks could credibly get done uh, in, I don't have to remind you, uh, is an election year? I, I guess I will, I will partly answer your question and, and, and partly punt. Uh, but to, to, to answer your question in, in, in the fullest way I can, we have laid out an agenda of areas in which we are going to uh, try to make advantage, advances that are in our interest that we believe, although it's up for them to decide, are in uh, the PRC's uh, interest as well. And these are real substantive areas of policy, you know, a military-to-military -military dialogue, 
uh, a dialogue about counter-narcotics, uh, and there'll be more significant steps taken on, on that in, in, in the coming days uh, ahead. Uh, you mentioned AI. Obviously, we have a robust and complicated inter interconnected economic relationship uh, with the PRC uh, that has uh, elements of, of severe competition uh, associated with it. All of that is going to be fair game uh, in, in the interaction between uh, the United States and China. The reason I'm reluctant to say, here's where we're trying to get by the end of the year, or here's where we will get, is that there are so many intervening factors uh, that can divert the course. And 2023 is a great example. I'm not going to go through the litany of things that happened. I can think of, the of year. one. Uh, I'm not, but uh, uh, there are black swans uh, that, that can come along, uh, particularly um, you know, in, a, in a big, consequential, strategic relationship like this that has so many facets. Uh, and we, it is our job both to be prepared for those, to manage them as constructively uh, as we can, consistent with our interests, and to try to keep our eye kind of laser focused on the affirmative agenda, and that's what we're gonna do. Thanks, well, before I get back to the allies, I, I can't pass up the challenge of North Korea. And you mentioned uh, North Korea, you touched on it, and certainly apropos of uh, Russia and the burgeoning Russia, North Korea cooperative dynamic, and this is a topic that came up in an earlier session. Uh, it's easy to see the flow of uh, ordinance from North Korea to uh, Russia. What's harder to see is the, the backflow of maybe technology and the wherewithal that helped North Korea to launch a satellite and advance its missile technology. But in addition to the risk posed by that nexus, um, North Korea is a persistent, dogged problem. It seems to be uh, accelerating in the threat profile. How do you think about it? What are you seeing and what, uh, what are you trying to do? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd, given your, uh, your own prior work on this topic, I'd love to hear your answer to your own question. I know that's not the the format, maybe we can catch up uh, afterwards. But I, I joke in part because I think, I suspect everyone in the, in the room would acknowledge, and I certainly do, that this is uh, a set of issues uh, for which there are no good answers. There have to be answers, and we have to find the best ones that are available, but there are no good answers. Uh, what you mentioned is uh, one of the many things I was alluding to when I said that this, uh, uh, the, that the DPRK is on a destabilizing and dangerous uh, trajectory, and that is uh, the deepening uh, military relationship between the DPRK and Russia. And we've spoken uh, extensively. I think we have revealed in a number of cases the depths of that relationship when it comes uh, to Ukraine. Uh, but as you rightly indicate, there is no uh, free lunch. Uh, uh, we, we, we are quite confident in, in this support, and it is part of why uh, we are concerned both about the DPRK's uh, support for Russia's uh, military enterprise uh, and also about Iran's uh, increasing support for Russian, uh, Russia's military enterprise. It's sort of a, a negative uh, twofer. It is impactful to Russia's ability to wage war uh, on Ukraine uh, in a wholly unlawful way, and the support that Russia provides in return uh, to these countries, we believe, will be fundamentally destabilizing and damaging uh, to security in the two regions uh, in which they are situated. So uh, none of that is good, and uh, it is both a, 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 an area of serious and intensive focus and is going to have to remain uh, as such, and we have tried to handle this in, in the best way uh, that we have been able to come up with, which is uh, intensely focus on deterrence and extended deterrence and expanding our, our um, discussions on those topics with core allies uh, in the region. And making quite clear in a number of instances uh, that we have been open to discussion uh, and engagement. You know, so far, uh, the DPRK has chosen to continue going down a very negative uh, path, um, but uh, uh, for now, we don't see a better way uh, than deterrence uh, and, and diplomacy if it ever uh, presents an opportunity. Well, I think the Biden administration gets credit for differentiating between the things that it can influence and the things like that, including a lot of North Korean behavior that uh, we're unable to stop, and that defense, deterrence, and where possible diplomacy is exactly the, the right combination. So that, that brings us to allies and partners, and here too, not to be too uh, laudatory, but I think the Quad initiative uh, and some of the other minilateral 
initiatives, particularly the Camp David trilateral uh, process, uh, been super important and uh, badly needed uh, movements. But uh, you're the one who pointed out at the beginning that follow through uh, implementation is one of the big challenges in, in your world. Tell us what the Quad is really producing. And, and producing, yes, for the United States, yes, for the four Quad members, yes, for the, uh, the allies and partners, but what is it producing for the region? So I, I guess I'd, I'd point to a few things. You, you, you singled out the quad, but I think all of these, uh, what, what I, people sometimes refer to as, as minilaterals, small groupings of, of uh, multilateral states, uh, we believe for them to be uh, consequential and meaningful and more than press releases, they have to be uh, a concrete. Uh, on the quad, I think the first and best example was the work uh, that was done in the early days of our administration uh, when we were still in the throes of, of the most intense period of the COVID crisis uh, to focus on uh, the development of, of vaccine uh, production capacity, combining uh, India's uh, ability to produce uh, with Japanese uh, capital and, and various technical aspects that the United States is uniquely uh, positioned uh, to, to bring to bear. That is one example of the kind of uh, uh, a multifaceted arrangement that a group like the four countries that make up the Quad are uniquely positioned to do, not just for our own interests, although profoundly uh, that sort of uh, arrangement is in our own interest, but more broadly to benefit uh, the region and, and the wider world. And we are going to continue to seek opportunities like that uh, to, to move things forward uh, th uh, through the Quad. You know, the, all of these arrangements are different. Obviously, uh, the, the U.S.-Japan ROK trilateral is first and foremost a, a security arrangement. It's a, it's a uh, intersection of, of alliances uh, focus exactly on the threat uh, that we just described. Uh, the trilateral that I described in my remarks uh, with Japan and the Philippines is, is focused in part on hard security, in part on economic security and cyber security, and each of these has to be tailored. Uh, AUKUS, which is obviously a, a partnership uh, that connects our European alliances uh, and our alliance uh, with Australia, uh, has submarines at the core, but there is Pillar 2 of AUKUS uh, as well, which goes far beyond uh, uh, just uh, the submarine cooperation uh, that we are going to be embarking on over the course of multiple generations. So, so these are varied, these are diverse, they are intended to focus on the problems that each set of countries is best positioned to address. Well, uh, building on that, one last question. Um, you mentioned uh, AUKUS, you mentioned uh, the Trilateral Summit. None of these were easy, I know. Um, but when it comes to the Quad, the Quad will progress only as far as and as much as India is prepared to go along. It's one thing to work with like-minded, traditional partners uh, who share a security perspective on the region. It's a different thing, and it's been, frankly, an extraordinary thing uh, to look at the uh, growth in uh, the partnership uh, between the United States and the other countries with uh, India. But how far can that go? Are we sort of reaching a point of diminishing returns giving, given some gaps in uh, India's threat perceptions, India's interests, as opposed to those of the United States? So. Uh just taking a half step back, because it sounds like you're on the cusp of, of wrapping this up, and I do want to say just in the context of both your India question and, and in our overall frame, this administration believes uh, something very different uh, from, from at least our immediate predecessor uh, administration, which is that America's network of, of alliances, of international agreements, of multilateral institutions are a force multiplier for U.S. interests in the world. They are a unique advantage that the United States has uh, among our uh, you know, nearest peer competitors. Not a burden uh, on the country. And I think that is a shift in U.S. policy that the beginning of this administration has marked and that we have tried to, to carry forward. And I think that we have been able to demonstrate the value proposition of that worldview, uh, not just for our partners and allies, although that's important, but for the American uh, people as well. And we're going to have to continue doing that. The value proposition in the U.S.-India relationship, the upside potential of that relationship, has, I think, always been almost acknowledged by consensus uh, to be enormous. And the question has always been, can it be realized? Can it be actualized? Uh, I think that we have made a significant down payment in the last year or two 
in that relationship. The two core areas are going to be, uh, for the foreseeable future, our cooperation on emerging technologies and uh, now increasingly our cooperation on defense and security issues. The economic side of the relationship is both um, undeniable and challenging, and we're gonna continue to work through, as we did in the context of Prime Minister Modi's visit uh, to Washington, removing uh, some of the underbrush and some of the barriers to deepening our economic cooperation, and we did take care of uh, some outstanding disputes. Um, but those are gonna be the three pillars of it, and we think we've made significant progress last year and, and have some work to do, uh, but, but feel good about the prospects for 24. Thanks. Well, John, I know you gotta hightail it back to the, uh, to the White House. We very much appreciated this time you shared with us. It has a bit of a speed dating feel to it, but you packed an awful lot in. So um, before I let you go, since this is the, the last session of our conference and we're gonna move to lunch and uh, beyond, uh, I wanna say first, a sincere vote of thanks to the Asia Society staff who have done an incredible amount of work. And a second deep vote of thanks to you, John, for, uh, for joining us and for your insights. Thank you all for having me.